Welcome. We'll be with you very soon. All right, welcome to today's webinar from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We appreciate you being here for our first Discovery Series webinar, which is focused on the 2022 Avian Taxonomy Update. With me today is a team of experts who can help us understand why taxonomy updates are necessary, how they're settled upon, and what it could mean for your life list. Um, before we get started with today's webinar, I would, which is hosted from Ithaca, New York, I want to read a statement acknowledging the indigenous peoples of the original inhabitants of this area. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakona, which is the Cayuga Nation. The Gayakona are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which is an alliance of six sovereign nations with historic and contemporary presence on this land. The con Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, um, New York State and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayakono people past and present to these lands and waters. So thank you. Let me turn on my video here. My name is Laura Kammermeyer and I'm the business manager for Birds of the World and I'll be facilitating today's discussion. And joining me is Jessica Kane. Turn on your video, Jess. And uh, she will be providing technical support behind the scenes and dropping some links into the video. Thank you, Jess. So if I could have the panelists turn on your videos. Welcome everybody. I'm really just thrilled to introduce our panelists today, which includes eminent avian taxonomy experts and developers of the technical infrastructure that supports it, plus a very special guest. First, let me introduce you to Tom Schulenberg. Tom has made significant contributions to the understanding of avian evolution and taxonomy. He has extensive field experience in South America and is the co-author of Birds of Peru. Tom currently manages the taxonomy and the nomenclature for all lab projects. He is science editor with Birds of the World as well. So hello, Tom. Oh, you're on mute. Hello, hello. Back on track. Great. So Sean Billerman is with us as well. Sean is also a science editor with Birds of the World and has a deep expertise in systematics, taxonomy, and evolutionary biology. He is a leading expert on bird families, and he co-authored the Bird Families of the World book, which was updated and merged into the Birds of the World project. Hello, Sean. Hi, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Also with us is Marshall Iliff. Hi, Marshall. Marshall is the project lead for eBird and the lead database coordinator and tech wizard who organizes the Clements Annual Taxonomy Updates behind the scenes. He also manages our global common names data sets, which allows Birds of the World readers to, under, to view common names of birds in up to 95 different language variations. Today, Marshall is tuning in all the way from Taiwan. Thank you, Marshall, for being with us. I know you're tired. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Brian Sullivan. Brian is the project lead for Birds of the World. And aside from leading that project, Brian spends a lot of time thinking about how integrated tools and technologies, when leveraged with global partnerships, um, can, can accomplish conservation at scale. Brian has conducted field work on birds for more than 25 years and has authored numerous papers for both popular and scientific literature. Hello, Brian. Hi, everybody. Super fun to see all the hellos coming into the chat from around the world. Glad to be here. So this is our special guest, Pamela Rasmussen. Hello, Pamela. Pamela holds several distinguished titles, including assistant professor at Michigan State University, the member of the editorial board of systematics in the Biodiversity Journal, founder of the global bird sound site called Avocet, the associate editor for Zootaxa, and co-managing editor of the IOC World Bird List. Pamela has also served on the North American Checklist Committee for more than 20 years, and her research focuses on the avifauna of Southern Asia. And she co-authored the second edition of Birds of South Asia, the Ripley Guide. In addition, Pam has authored or co-authored the scientific descriptions of 11 new species of Asian birds and serves an as an associate editor with us here on Birds of the World. So thank you for joining us, Pam. Having me and I'm looking forward to it. 
Great. So I want to point out that Tom, Pam, and Marshall all serve on the IOU WGAC committee. So that's a lot, big acronyms there. That is the International Ornithologist Union Working Group of Avian Checklists, which we will refer to as the working group during this session. So Tom and Pam serve as taxonomic authorities, while Marshall provides database and technical infrastructure support. So thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. So before we get started, we have a couple tech related announcements. So closed captioning is available in English. And if you'd like to turn the captions on or off, just hit the live transcript or CC button at the bottom of your screen. Someone asked if the captions would be translated into Spanish. Please contact us if, there's, if you are interested in that and we will be able to gauge the interest so we know whether we should invest in that. Um, today's panel discussion will, will loosely fall into three parts. First, we would like to provide an overview of this year's changes, and then we'd like to provide an explanation or just have a discussion of the major taxonomic systems and the hows and whys of bird name changes. And the last part will be devoted to audience Q&A. So we were pleasantly overwhelmed by the interest in today's webinar and received more than 200 questions from people in 90 countries. So we are really thrilled about the interest and and I read each and every one, we summarized it. And so the flow of today's discussion will generally follow the interests of, of what people asked during, that, um, during their registration. So additional questions will be welcome. And there's a good chance that, um, that it was already considered in today's discussion. Or if you don't, don't hear it, it's really about it being just too specific for to fit inside one hour discussion. So today, know that we'll be focusing mostly on higher level concepts regarding taxonomy, and we welcome questions along those same lines. So if you do want to ask a question today, this is important, please put it in the Q&A box rather than the chat, which is at the bottom of your screen, okay? So we won't be monitoring the chat for questions. You're welcome to have discussions there, as long as they're respectful and collegiate. But if you have a question for our panel, please put it in the Q&A. And Jessica and I will be monitoring the Q&A for, um, for the last part of our discussion. Okay. So yes, um, the last thing is, please consider leaving us feedback about the presentation at the end. All right, great. So let's get started. So Tom, I would love you to give us a summary of this year's taxonomic changes. Okay. <clears throat> well, one of the most important things is we do try and stay current with the uh, classification committees that cover the Western Hemisphere, the two committees of the uh, AOS, the American Ornithological Society there. North, Amer North American and South American classification committees. But as uh, Laura mentioned, beyond that, we've been working, uh, doing a lot of work on a global basis through WGAC, the Working Group on Avian Checklists, uh, which is a big checklist alignment project. And we'll, we'll be talking more about that later. The upshot is that we had uh, a tremendous amount of churn this past year introducing to our checklist, the Clements checklist, 118 splits, uh, which is a lot for us, and 41 lumps, which is a very high number for us. Um, <clears throat> we also added five completely new entries this year. So in total, we had a net gain of, of 82 species. Um, we almost always add at least one brand new species each year, new in the sense of newly described. Often we have several newly described species uh, that are added. This year we had three, two of which come from the same region, uh, the Maratus Mountains in southeastern Borneo, and another one from uh, South America. What's interesting this year is that we had two additional species that we're adding that are not newly described. These are species that had been described many, many years ago, decades ago, but had gotten, uh, but they're closely similar to 
more widespread and better known species. And so their validity as species in their own right uh, was not established until very recently. One of these is a uh, species of weaver from East Africa, the Ruvu weaver. And the second one is a species of seabird, the New Caledonian storm petrel. So that's that's one of the more interesting uh, novel twists this year is the uh, validation of those two uh, previously overlooked species. Excellent. So the total number of world bird species stands at what? Oop, lost your your mute button is still on. Again. Yeah, in our checklist that stands at ten thousand nine hundred and six. Mm -hmm. um, I forget exactly where the uh, IOC World Bird List stands, but we're we're tacking ever closer to uh, to convergence with them. That's that's part of the alignment that we're global mm -hmm. alignment that we're working towards. Great. And we'll talk more about that soon. Okay, Sean, would you like to show the audience some of the more exciting highlights? Yes. Um, just let me. So I'm just going to be uh, giving a, a very brief um, overview of uh, a few of the changes that Tom uh, just mentioned. Um, so one of those um, includes the newly described uh, NT tanager. Um, which Tom mentioned is one of the three newly described species that was added to um, Birds of the World and the Clements Checklist in 2022. Um, it was colloquially called the San Pedro Tanager um, in eBird uh, prior to its being uh, officially described. Um, it breeds in Bolivia. Hey, Sean, excuse me, Sean. Um, yeah. we're, we're seeing your presenter view instead uh, of the pre presentation okay. itself. I thought I there Better. you go. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. See, I set that up. I thought I set that up before the meeting and then it changed on me. Anyway, so um sorry about that. The NT Tanager was um originally discovered in 2000 um in southeastern Peru. Um, but very little was known about this very distinctive and striking species until it was uh until its breeding grounds were discovered um in northwestern Bolivia in 2011. Um, and it, as I mentioned, it was officially described to science in 2021. Um, relatively little is known about this species, but it appears to be an intratropical migrant breeding in the deciduous and semi-deciduous woodlands of Bolivia and migrating to low montane rainforest and cloud forest in uh, Peru. Uh, next, I wanted to highlight the Ruvu weaver, which Tom also mentioned. This is a newly added taxon to the Clements checklist. Um, but it was technically described uh, to science in 1891, and it was accepted as a valid species by most authorities at the time. However, in 1916, one author considered it indistinguishable from the African golden weaver, which it was since the author who made that claim was indeed looking at African golden weaver specimens and not actual Ruvu weaver specimens. As a, as a result of this mistake, the species was largely forgotten about until the early 2000s, when some began to notice different looking weavers that matched birds uh, that, uh, of the Ruva weaver's original description from 1891. Genetic analyses have since shown that the Ruva weaver, despite its similarity to African golden weaver, is not actually closely related and is indeed a valid species. Um, another um, newly added species to Birds of the World and Clements Checklist is the Chihuahuan Meadowlark, which is the result of um, a species split from Eastern Meadowlark. Um, it's long been recognized as a distinctive group that was probably a valid species separate from Eastern Meadowlark. Um, it ranges from Arizona and New Mexico south to Sinaloa um, and Durango in Mexico, and it was officially recognized as a separate species largely based on the research of Joanna Beam and colleagues. And it was split due to genetic differences and vocal differences, with the Chihuahuan Meadowlark found to be as different from Eastern Meadowlark as Eastern Meadowlark is from Western Meadowlark. Um, another uh, new species to Birds of the World and Clements is the Indian Pied Starling. This is the result of another split um, from the Asian Pied Starling into three separate species. Um, it's most closely related to 
um, the Siamese pied starling. And these two show a deep genetic divergence across a relatively narrow geographic area, which suggests that there is relatively little gene flow between these two species, further supporting its recognition as a distinct species. And finally, I wanted to highlight um, not a species gain, but a species loss, um, the royal parrot finch. Um, and it really illustrates some of the complexities of taxonomy and classification. Um, and the status of the species may yet change in the future, but based on current evidence, um, treating the royal parrot finch and the red-headed parrot, parrot finch, which were previously considered separate species, um, treating these two as uh, one species seems to be the best option given their near total lack of plumage differences um, and no real um, differences that are known. Um, and these, uh, this species is found on Vanuatu and Samoa, and it feeds primarily on figs. And I will stop my share. And... You're, Laura, you're on mute. So that's just the tip of the iceberg for what's what's available this year to study. So we'll give you some resources later on in terms of where you can do some more research and find new find really good information about wh what was changed and how it was changed and why. So Marshall, as the technical manager of all this Clemens update behind the scenes, can you just give us a little sense of what that means for Birds of the World, eBird, and all the other lab projects where this happens? Yeah, sure. So the, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a huge hub for a vast amount of, of data on birds. Um, that obviously includes um, the species accounts that are available in Birds of the World, um, similar species accounts that are available in Merlin, a um, bit less detailed. But all of those require you know authors to do manual updates, and I think others will talk about that. Um, but we also have this huge observational data set um, and that includes eBird records, uh, also great specimens and audio recordings. Um, and you can think of think of those like sort of the traditional ornithological specimens that sit in museums. Um, each of those come with a date and a location. And when a split happens, uh, we really have to go through and apply logic rules or sometimes just manually look at each specimen to try to determine um, which of the daughter species that may fall into. Uh, so, so that that process can be can be fairly simple. Uh, something like a lump tends to be fairly simple to implement across that data set. So, royal and red-headed parrot finch, we can sort of. Um, as they're lumped, we maintain the subspecies that the, the bird was originally reported as. But for something like a split, um, it can be fairly straightforward, uh, but but a manual process to, to implement something like the split of amber mountain rock thrush, which breeds in far, far northern Madagascar on, on a really isolated mountain range and doesn't overlap with forest rock thrush um, that it was split from, which is sort of in the remainder of Madagascar. Mm -hmm. So that sort of requires looking at where the records are from and, and dividing those out and manually applying those to, to all the data sets that, that these observations are connected to. Uh, but then something like Chihuahuan versus Eastern Meadowlark is really complicated because nobody has sort of uh, parsed these species out as carefully as they're starting to do now with this split. So understanding exactly where the contact area is in Oaxaca, Mexico, or in um, the panhandle of Texas is, is sort of um, new knowledge taking taking shape right now. Right now, we're, we're having a, a pretty interesting discussion on one of the hummingbird splits uh, in, in South America to figure out exactly what mountain range. And, and in the process of doing that, Macaulay library specimens have probably highlighted a historical error in, in going way, way back in some older publications about where these birds occur. So, um, so it can be everything from a very simple process to kind of split two chunks yeah. of data into two to a really complicated one that goes back to probably publication where the, uh, Right. So visions to historical accounts. Mm -hmm. So eBird is has celebrated its 20th year recently. So there's 20 years of data, a billion observations, right? So you yeah. have to, even more now, you have to reassign that for 
for a great number of species and every single observation needs to either be manually or 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 through through your scripts and everything separated or lumped so that's requires a lot of work and a lot of uh, a lot of attention to detail and geography and dates to be able to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and we really view that as a service to the eBirders that have, have put in so much time and effort to submit these records and contribute observations and photos. So, it, so it's really important when we sort of change the taxonomy underfoot to apply those to people's personal data and life mm -hmm. lists. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so without that service, people would be on their own accord to have to go back as, as part of whatever they need to, as very also as part of making the day. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We're having a little bit of, little bit of uh, connection issues there. Hopefully y'all can, can understand them. Uh, yes. So other, other, if you don't have that service, you are responsible for making all those changes. And then of course, after so many years, it would be very overwhelming for an individual to take that on themselves. Well, great. So, so, so at the lab, then we have all these projects that is a design project that people contribute to, and what this allows is a single taxonomic backbone behind all of the projects. And you know, we have the Macaulay Library, which is a media library. We have Birds of the World, which is content, and we have eBird, which provides a range and distribution and abundance information. So, Brian, I'm wondering if you could tell us what are some of the the benefits of having this single taxonomic backbone, and how do all these things work together? This integration of media, data, and and content. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, I think it's was really wise of the lab uh, 20 or 30 years ago to, to have taxonomy at the core of everything that we do. So some people on the call might know what a content management system is. It's how you publish things and keep track of things on the internet. Well, we, we have a system like that that we've built here at the lab that's fundamentally underpinned by this taxonomy, right? So every everything in this building that's linked to birds is linked to this taxonomy so that when a change happens, we can push that change out in the same way across all the projects that we have at the lab. And that allows us to make tools like eBird, Merlin, Birds of the World, um, all of these things into a sort of a seamless ecosystem when it comes to taxonomy. And as Marshall was just talking about, it, it's it's seamless, but it's a lot of work to keep it seamless because every time there's any little change, every one of those projects has to tap into the new taxonomy, whether they like it or not. So we have to do a lot of coordination before the taxonomy is released to make sure that when the new taxonomy comes out, we don't have a lot of gaps in our services that we're providing to birders, uh, scientists, and ultimately, what I think is really important is that this, this effort that is being undertaken now to merge checklists, the major checklists around the world, the WGAC, that's going to really allow the data that come from the lab, the data products that are so important now. eBird just released yesterday um, new trends outputs for some 550 North American and, and some global birds. Um, those kinds of outputs that are coming out that are so important for science, it's really important that the world understands what taxon we're talking about and that we're all agreed on what we're talking about. So as these checklists come together, um, I think you're going to see a lot more utility uh, in some of the services that we provide. So that's how it works here. Excellent. So at the same time, the taxonomic backbone is being restructured according to these uh, taxonomy updates. Uh, the Birds of the World editorial team works behind the scenes to create, um, you know, new species accounts or lump species or split species. Um, uh, can maybe Sean or or any anyone from Birds of the World be able to speak to that? What does that look like? Uh, yeah, well, um, as everyone on on the on our panel can can attest, it's kind of a mad dash. Um, to get everything um, updated um, in terms of making sure that we have um, content for every single species and to make sure that um, even if everything isn't uh, perfectly polished, 
that all of our accounts um, clearly uh, demonstrate what those changes were that led to the new accounts. Mm -hmm. um, and we make sure to go through all the media um, that are in the accounts and uh, to, to make sure that media from other, spe uh, other species is no longer in there. And we really try to update um, all of our maps uh, to reflect the new, either whether it's a split or a lump, um, whether, yeah, two, two taxa were turned into separate species or, or merged back into one. Um, so it, it's a lot to keep track of, but um, yeah, uh, we, you know, we, we have a great team and we, 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 we did it. <laughs> so we did it. Right. So, so you had said that to the, if the very base is we need to understand why that, you know, why that species was either split or lumped and, and for any gaps in knowledge, that's where this expanding editorial team, and that's where the, the, the desire and the need to work with authors around the world who have more intimate familiarity with the species become so important. And that's where the involvement in the growing editorial structure of Birds of the World is, is really important. It's not like just based here at Cornell, it's, it's everyone can help build this. It's a participatory platform. Excellent. Yeah, so, and our our team of of editors and authors, you know, like you said, we we our team spans the globe, so we we really are able to bring in expertise from from everywhere to to help, uh, right. not just in the taxonomy update effort, but in maintaining birds of the world in general. Right. And last time I checked, there was about two hundred and no, two thousand and twenty different authors somewhere around there. So it's really um, really a group effort. A lot of people are interested in knowing how these updates affect their personal birding list. So what advice would you give them to be able to sort of after the fact, be able to go and say, oh, what does this mean for me? Um, Marshall, maybe? Yeah, I'm gonna try no video and see if that helps with the, with the connection issues. Um, I know that's a little weird to <laughs> turn my video off when I speak, but... Um, yeah, so so we have a we have a very detailed eBird story that goes through all the all the changes, and and embedded right into that story are links to your personal eBird data. Uh, so it it should be fairly straightforward to click down and say I want to check my records of Eastern Meadowlark or Chihuahuan Meadowlark or Amber Mountain Rock Thrush if you're lucky enough to have seen that um, just right from that story. So that's that's one easy way to do it. Um, you can also you know, download your data in eBird, you can check maps in eBird, but um, so so there's multiple ways. Also there, there are links from Birds of the World accounts and eBird species pages uh, with a little check mark that indicate if you've seen the species. And if you if you click that, it takes you to the to the list of all the sightings that you've had. So that's a good good place to check and make sure that Marshall and his team uh, accurately updated your records. Um, so I think Jess is going to put in the um, in our chat links to the description, both to the eBird announcement of that, as well as the Clements checklist with all of the more um, more specific data about the decisions for the split. So that will should be coming to the chat soon. Great. So, so let's transition now to how taxonomic decisions get made, who makes them, and what evidence they use. So, Pam, I would love for you to tell us, um, you know, the lab uses the eBert's Clements checklist, and, and this complements three other world checklists, but also several regional checklists. So all of these checklists, I understand, vary in their philosophy and kind of how they look at things. And I would love for you just to explain that for people who don't know much about that. Well, um, I, I would say that all of the checklists operate using the biological species concept, which is not to say that the, there's not validity to the phylogenetic species concept as well, but this is just the fact that, that all of us, all of our checklists use the BSC. Mm -hmm. And that uh, assumes that two populations cannot regularly interbreed successfully with uh, a high degree of, of um, success, basically. And so we evaluate the evidence for differentiation in terms of molecular differentiation and morphological differentiation 
uh, vocal divergence, but that of course depends, uh, the utility of that depends on the type of species it is because some birds are, are really not vocal and some birds, you know, many species will have the same type of vocalization and then others learn their vocalizations. So, so vocal divergence is very, very useful in certain groups, but not in others and um, or less so in others. And uh, we also look, of course, at if, if there's a contact zone or a, a zone of peripatry, we try to look at the evidence for uh, what's happening in those zones. And it often takes a tremendous amount of effort of, re of research to establish what's happening. And now the genomic tools have advanced to the point where um, papers can give us a very, very good idea as to whether there is or has been recent intergradation. For example, with the, the uh, amazing papers that came out on the um, um, on Sternella liliani that allowed us to split that, mm -hmm. um, that provided the evidence that really nailed it down, that showed that they're really not interbreeding, at least not extensively. And so we have to take as much uh, and as many different types of evidence into account as possible. Often we only have, for example, we only have um, uh, maybe mitochondrial DNA evidence plus the morphological evidence that uh, may not have been very well analyzed or, or critically analyzed. So often we have a really limited set of data that we can draw on. In other cases, we have um, lots of evidence and in, much, in many cases, you know, very high quality evidence. So it's really, really variable. But in each case of a, of a divergence between the four major checklists of birds of the world, we have to make a decision. So it can be based on really good evidence or it can be based on much less compelling evidence. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. So just briefly, what are the major checklists in the world that people should just know about the global checklist? Well, there's the Howard and Moore checklist, which uh, has been um, edited in multiple versions by Edward Dickinson and various co uh, collaborators, uh, but it hasn't been updated in several years. And then there's the um, um, Handbook of Birds of the World and BirdLife International um, data zone and checklists that have been continuously updated and have followed the um, the seven point criteria for establishing, for scoring differences, and thus has led to a lot of, of splits that other checklists hadn't adopted. And then there's the uh, IOC checklist, World Bird Names checklist that I'm co-managing and um, that was started by Frank Gill, who's still involved. And um, uh, that is a checklist that has espoused the idea that um, if, Two species, two forms appear to be separate species based on um, divergence. It's um, the the burden of proof is on proving that they're not separate species, basically. So that's mm -hmm. a slightly different and operationally different uh, framework than the than most of the other checklists. Okay. And then, of course, there's there's Clements. So right. Um, I was wondering why do we call it the eBird slash Clements checklist. I, a couple of people were wondering in our questions. Well, uh, the Clements checklist used to be a standalone project written by the late uh, James Clements, but when it was brought to the lab, uh, we needed a global checklist for the eBird project, and which then later fed into other projects such as with a global reach such as birds of the world. The reason we specify eBird as part of the name is because <clears throat> eBird, um, well, to step back just a, just a slight bit, I mean, eBird's goal is to collect every observation of, of every bird around the world. Um, they don't they don't get literally every observation but <clears throat> they get a lot they certainly want them all but to be able to bring every observation into a single database you need to find a way of accommodating these different checklists if we don't split something but the ioc checklist does 
and someone wants to report it using the IOC name, then <clears throat> Ebert has a problem uh, if we're limited on the Clement side to, to just, just one name. So long, long ago, Ebert introduced a, a, uh, uh, a separate layer into the checklist, which is not formally taxonomically recognized. It's, it's what we call the eBird group. And a um, group allows us to accommodate many, but not all other alternative arrangements. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, I think IOC is stepping away from this, but they used to recognize more than one species of osprey whereas we had only a single species. If you wanted, but we could introduce with, through the eBird groups, we could introduce a group for what we would call the North American subspecies of osprey and a group for an Australian subspecies mm -hmm. and so on down the line. So if you reported something as, you know, the Australian species, it would feed into uh, the Clements taxonomy via, via that group uh, hierarchy. Right. And it's become, uh, you know, massive, and it's, it's very, very useful to the birder. The, basically, when you see a group, um, it's flagging something that either was, usually it's flagging something that either was previously recognized as a species or is recognized as a species by somebody else. And so right away, you know, you should get this spidey sense that this is something you should, you should pay attention, pay more attention to, and make sure that you specify if you can in your observations what group it was. Because if they are split down the line, that as Marshall outlined earlier, eBird will will manage your life list for you. So on the you know at one level it's a tool for for savvy birders savvy twitchers but mostly it's a tool to allow us to integrate observations from other other taxonomies and it's become extremely important to the way that we collect data mm -hmm. so much so that the the ter team uh, the term eBird became incorporated into our name understand okay so i want to get to the merging of these systems at next but i before i do that i just want marshall um could you explain in our common names data set you can actually choose an ioc version if that is the taxonomy that you're used to right don't we have an english ioc yeah we do, we do we we offer um, a, a lot of different common name i'm going to go video off um we offer a lot of common name translations. You can see your bird names in German, in French, in um, Thai, in <laughs> Chinese, uh, lots and lots of options. But but that also allows for both regional versions of English. So you can see gray plover versus black-bellied plover or um, other other names that vary around the world. Uh, but also for, for both IOC and BirdLife International, uh, which, are, which are close partners of the work we do on taxonomy, uh, we offer the uh, mm -hmm. sort of alternate common name that's used in those in those taxonomies. A lot, most of the times, those taxonomies are one to one match, so we're just uh, showing alternate English names. But there are cases where it's actually a taxonomic level change, um, as Tom was talking about, where something we consider a species um, could be a subspecies in IOC or uh, vice versa. Uh, and in those cases, we do have the structure of both subspecies and also sort of the slash option. So red build slash black build streamer tail is available in eBird to report, both because sometimes in the field, you can't see the bill color on the streamer tails in Jamaica. And, and you might want to still indicate that you saw one, you just weren't sure what species. Um, but it also allows us to um, sort of track data across data sets or across taxonomies when we offer those options, because um, the old version of just the streamer tail um, equates exactly to the red build slash black build streamer tail because those are the two options. Um, so that's really important for what we do and how how the data are managed both within the lab of ornithology and uh, across other data sets. 
Excellent. And the way to make that change is go to your preferences, either in Birds of the World or eBird, and then uh, go to preferences and then check um, language preferences in there and you can select. So that's, I think that'll be welcome news for a lot of folks out there. Um, so yeah, so can we talk about the efforts to merge all of these taxonomies? What's going on at that, at that level? Any, I would just open that up to the panel, anyone who would like to start. I, Adam, do you want I to can. Start? Oh, I, I was just gonna say I I can start with sort of my secretarial role, which um, which leans very heavily on Avibase, which uh, is a project that Denis Lepage has has managed to to basically sync up these taxonomies. So the starting point for this uh, WGAC group is to um, is to identify all the cases where eBird Clements IOC and BirdLife especially have have a difference in their taxonomic treatments of at the species level and we're we're stepping systematically through all bird families uh and trying to trying to tackle those so we're we're well over halfway through the the global bird list now after about a year and a half of of concerted work um and uh and what I do as sort of the, the secretary of this group is to queue up all those issues and sort of give a brief description of these are the places where the treatments differ. Um, but I'll let I'll let Pam or Tom talk about the taxonomic side of that, the decision making side. Well, just to add another perspective here, Brian was talking earlier about how taxonomy is integrated into what we do at the lab, and it allows information to flow seamlessly throughout our system, eBird, Birds of the World, Macaulay Library, everything is tagged um, with the same the same name and that happens instantly. But there's a lot of other sources of information out there in the world that we would want to be able to tap into. You know, there's the IUCN uh, Red List, for example. There's lots of databases about that have different bits of information about birds. And what we're really looking for is a structure here where information can flow seamlessly, you know, from one source to another, but different taxonomies continually trip that up. So the WGAC process is uh, designed to bring alignment to the four major checklists that Pam outlined earlier. And which is, you know, there are other checklists out there, but these are the ones that are the highest profile and, and the most most complete. As Marshall says, we've been working on this for uh, about a year and a half now. A lot of our work is reflected already in Clement's checklist. And when IOC has their next checklist release, you'll see a lot more of these convergences suddenly show up on, on their side as well. The focus right now through this process is uh, strictly at the level of the species and the genus, which is our, our highest priority to get information flowing freely throughout the world at, uh, at those levels. Um, It'll probably take us at least a year, perhaps a little longer, to complete this process at the species level. Uh, once we get that done, there's still going to be some mop-up work to do. Ideally, we would be into alignment on higher-level classification issues, uh, which families to recognize, how many orders to recognize, and also uh, uh, at a finer level, alignment on uh, which subspecies to uh, to recognize. And of course, we also are going to need to uh, keep this unified list uh, current with modern research. So hopefully we'll be able to maintain uh, you know a functioning uh, committee going going forward, although the workload, uh, I certainly hope will be much, much less than it is right now because we're we're rushing as quickly as we can to reach uh, to reach alignment and it's um we have a lot of ground to cover i just uh, want to point out for the audience that you know tom what tom is particularly talking about the working group right now you know not cornell university specific this is the working group for avian checklist so that is a global you know you have experts from all over the world on that team correct 
Correct. And I don't know uh, whether Jess has the uh, link to the WGAC website to plop into the chat or not, but uh, the, the ideal is that eventually most, if not all of these four global checklists will, you know, can consolidate into a single a single list when, when i say we're looking for alignment that that's what that's what i mean our, our intention is to here at the clement side is to adopt uh going forward you know the the consensus uh iouw get decisions as the core of core of our checklist mm -hmm. um, and we hope that other checklists will will follow suit so the the if we reach that goal, then then a lot of this, you know, you know, the, the, these little rough edges around the margins between our different checklists will uh, disappear, or there will be at least many, many fewer of them. That's that's the goal that we're working towards. Right. And again, um, all with the idea of sharing as much information as we can, as freely as we can across across boundaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we lost Pam, so Jessica's going to try to help get Pam back on our conversation here today. Um, so yeah, somebody did ask, do you have any predictions about where the Clemens checklist is heading? Should we expect hundreds of new species added, a few dozen? Um, and how long might this unification process take based on your understanding of the amount of work that it requires? Uh, well, like I said, I, I think we have a at least a year to go. Um, Marshall may have a somewhat more more refined sense of uh, what the workload is. Um, the uh, we have to pace ourselves a little bit, though. I mean, we want to get it done as quickly as possible, but I think we're also realizing that the pace we've been at so far is running the risk of uh, burnout for some of our some of our team. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I would I would project a, about a year could be a little more could be uh, could be a little less. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the second? There was a second part of the question. Oh well, well it, it, like I said, it, it, as I had mentioned earlier, our goal then is to is to you know essentially adopt the WGAC checklist as mm -hmm. climates itself would basically cease to disappear. The lab would be using the consensus uh, checklist. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we hope uh, that most or all of the other checklists would take a would take a similar approach. Great. Um, all right. So let's start talking about the criteria that, pe that people use in order to ex to examine whether it's a species or not, um, and um, and also the role of DNA and other types of systems to to define species. So, Sean, do you want to give that a start? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so you mentioned DNA, um, and I would definitely say that um, analysis of uh, genetics um, has certainly been revolutionary in helping us to understand um, the evolution of different groups, and it has certainly helped us to make make these decisions about what um, species are. But it really is never; it's often never the only tool that we use in making these decisions. And even in cases where the main impetus for recognizing a species has been from the analyses of genetic data, these analyses are usually only a part of the decision. And they often help us to recognize other differences um, that may have been unnoticed or not deemed important originally uh, for the recognition of species. So for example, in last year's taxonomy update in 2021, um, we ended up recognizing over a dozen new species of Antpida from the formerly large, expensive Rufus Antpida complex. And genetic analyses showed that, you know, a bunch of these different populations that we now recognize as species um, were actually more closely related to other species of Antpida rather than what we always thought of as Rufus Antpida. And those results led to further analyses of vocal differences. And in uh, birds like antpittas, where song is um, innate and not learned, those vocal differences are really key to um, understanding uh, species diversity and recognizing different species. 
as song is one of the ways that birds recognize each other. So even in a case where they all look the same for the most part, the song differences, which we never really appreciated until the genetic analyses showed us that there are all these different groups actually involved. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and, and there's you know a myriad of other ways that we've been able to use genetic uh, data as well, um, which uh, we could probably get into in a little bit mm -hmm. in some of the other questions. Yeah. Um, so when different lines of evidence don't agree, we have a committee that evaluates all that evidence. And then there's some I'm sure that agree, some that don't. And I wondered kind of what that process looks like. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I, I think Pam mentioned this earlier. Um, part of that depends on the quality of, of the data involved. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of the data involved. Um, and so the, there are certainly cases where we may have a very limited amount of genetic resources available, and they may hint at one thing, but the um, collective evidence from all the other, from morphology, from song, from behavior, and all these other things may not be strong enough to warrant recognition as a species at that time until we are able to dive in and get more and collect more information and do more research. Um, Tom, any any thoughts on on your end on how to deal with discrepancies in data? Um, sorry, I was typing something in the chat. I, I wasn't completely following your uh, your discussion. So, uh, um, but. Um, we're we're getting at when different lines of evidence don't agree. What does that right? Mean? Well, yeah. Th this is this is one reason why the different checklists, you know, have different species totals. Is because the composition of each checklist committee is a little different. Each committee is made up of, you know, people who have a lot of expertise in in the subjects, but each person brings to it, you know, their own particular operational criteria the the fact is that you know we're, we're in alignment on maybe 95 or more percent of of you know we're, we're in a great deal of agreement on what species to recognize the cases where agreement breaks down are cases where um, information is is limited and so everyone may tend to be biased by whatever information they find most most compelling in any particular case. And of course, the, the as Pam mentioned early on, we, we adhere to a biological species concept, but operationally, a biological species concept is very difficult to apply in cases of populations that are geographically separated, allopatric populations. So, uh, populations on different islands in uh, Indonesia or populations on a mainland versus islands, those kinds of situations. And so, um, you know, then it, you know, you have, you have cases where there's no direct uh, test of reproductive isolation and information is limited and it, it mm -hmm. know, often comes down to um, just any particular person's gut feel on how strong the evidence is in any particular case. You know, I, ideally, you know, you would have the full suite, genetic information, morphological information, data on vocalizations. If we had all that, you know, we, you know in each case, then I, I think we'd almost always rapidly find, find a consensus view. It, it just gets trickier when the information is, is more limited. Uh, you want more information, but you're not going to get it anytime soon. So you just have to, uh, you know, make your best guess uh, at this at this point in time, um, and you yeah, well, know, routinely call out for more research on on this group or that group. We spend a lot of our time doing just that. And in, in a few minutes, we'll get to how citizen scientists can help. But first, let's cover the issue of hybridization and how you kind of, how taxonomists deal with the issue of hybridization or birds found in hybrid zones. Can you give us an example of some species that 
um, are in hybrid zones, but you know that there's some tricky speciation going on there? Uh, yeah, so, um, so hybrid zones are geographic regions where two species ranges overlap and hybridization occurs somewhat regularly. Um, and, you know, they've often been touted as natural laboratories to understand the process of speciation. Um, and while the existence of hybrids does imply that two species are able to interbreed, um, which in some case, some ways goes against the um, uh, rules of the biological species concept, which we all follow, what happens next is really important in helping us to understand whether two groups are species. So unlike in some famous uh, like mammalian cases like uh, mules, hybrids between a horse and a donkey, most avian hybrids and hybrid zones do not involve complete infertility of hybrids. And so interbreeding itself is not a dead end, but hybrids are, even though they are able to reproduce, they're often less fit than either of the uh, two parent species. And even when there's a slight decrease in fitness, and I'm using fitness here, um, that could be um, the number of offspring that you have. So even if there's a slight reduction in the number of offspring, if there's a slight reduction in the lifespan or more difficulty in attracting mates, that can all have really big consequences, especially on like the time scale of evolution and speciation. And those consequences can either lead to an eventual end of hybridization over many, many generations, or the interbreeding ends up being so limited that you don't lose the identity of the core constituent species. And we really study hybrid zones to really understand whether two distinct populations represent valid species. And while we can't usually measure fitness directly, um, that takes tons and tons and tons and tons of time, um, you know, we, we can use proxies to, to get at this and genetic data um, is usually crucial in this. So in this taxonomic update, for example, red-billed and black-billed streamer tail, hummingbirds were split on the basis of hybrid zone research by Caroline Judy, who found that the area over which the two groups hybridized was only three kilometers wide, which is extremely narrow. And it really implies that there is very strong selection against hybrids. And so it's really hypothesized that differences in courtship displays limit hybridization in this group. And so hybrids might have an intermediate courtship behavior and they're just not as successful. And so these two groups remain independent uh, species. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, go oh yeah, go ahead, Tom. Go ahead, go ahead, finish your thought. Oh, I was just gonna say that, you know, even, so we have this perfect example of how hybrid zones can really help us to understand species, but even in cases where we have really good research on hybrid zones, it's still not always enough to overcome uh, just, there are gray areas of, of, of taxonomy and species do represent a continuum um, from, you know, just interbreeding populations to very distinct species. And, you know, the yellow rumped warbler complex in North America really illustrates kind of that gray intermediate case. So, you know, in the hybrid zone, there is very little evidence for assortative mating or for like myrtle warblers to mate with other myrtle warblers, which is really important in uh, for, for species recognition. But there's also evidence for strong selection against hybrids. And so, you know, it comes down to what what you put more weight on. And that's why there has been so much disagreement on, you know, this particular case. Um, you know, some people put more weight on the lack of assortative mating, and some people put more weight on the la uh, reduced hybrid fitness. And so hybrid zones still aren't always enough to answer these questions, but they're often really helpful in addressing these questions. Yeah, and another, another take on this is that the uh, emphasis on hybridization dates back to when the biological species concept itself was, you know, first formulated decades ago. And, you know, put put crudely, I, I think the original idea, again, decades ago, was that if you mixed 
two species together through hybridization, it was a little bit like, uh, you know, pouring tea into your water. You got something that was an equal blend of, of both constituent parts. And in recent decades, as especially as um, we've developed this whole suite of genetic technologies, we've discovered that hybridization is extremely rampant in birds. And even birds that are only distantly related still retain the ability to hybridize. And we have examples of species that routinely hybridize that are not each other's closest relatives, like with Baltimore and Bullock's Orioles and the Great Plains. It used to be assumed that, that those were you know, most closely related to each other. And, and now we know that that's actually not the case. Each is more closely related to some other, some other species. Um, so we have many cases where uh, well, we have some, you know, and it runs the whole spectrum now. We've got species that look very, very different that are genetically almost identical, like golden-winged and blue-winged warblers in North America. And uh, we have hybrid zones that, like yellow-rumped and, and myrtle warblers, the, the, the two main groups of yellow-rumped warblers, that hybridize on a very, very long but narrow front and you know, that the width of the hybrid zone does not seem to be changing. And we've got other cases where one species seems to be in the process of swamping another one, at, at least genetically. So I think part of what's going on right now is that we're still kind of coming to grips with just how rampant hybridization is in birds. And we're having to, on the fly, reevaluate, uh, you know, what that means for when we do and don't recognize recognize species. Uh, width of a hybrid zone, you know, is important to a lot of us in terms of evaluating in the absence of other information. Not most cases are not anywhere near as well studied as the yellow worm warbler case. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, narrow, you know, narrow hybrid zone is is kind of a imprecise term. You know, a lot of us, you know, would interpret a narrow hybrid zone as representing two species, not one, despite the hybridization. But you'll never get anyone to define what a narrow hybrid zone is. It's just uh, it's just your interpretation of the evidence you have. It sounds like everyone just does the best they can with the evidence available. So we're 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 getting really short on time, we're actually, but we have these experts in, here, and I just we're going to take a little extra time. I know a lot of people record that we are recording it, and we will be sending it out. So so either stick with us if you can. If not, you can get the last couple of minutes of the of the webinar in the recording. Okay, so I just have three questions for for you all if you could just give us a really brief answer some people are interested in what's going on at the family level for in in terms of um taxonomy changes and we have sean who's a leading expert in bird families so sean what can you tell us about what's going on in, in terms of families yeah so i mean over the past 20 years we've really have converged on uh largely agreement uh at the family level um for instance you know, uh clement's uh, recognizes 249 families, IOC recognizes 253, and BirdLife International recognizes 246. And so there's a lot of agreement. But where we differ, you know, is cases where things don't really fit neatly into one family or another. Uh, one example is the crested shrike jay. Um, we currently recognize this as its own family, uh, platylophidae, but um, evidence for recognition is not necessarily very strong and other arrangements have been proposed. Um, you know, another species pair that has been variously grouped with with other families is the green hylia, uh, which is currently uh, grouped with a family of African songbirds, Macrosphenidae, um, in our taxonomy, but current evidence suggests that it's probably best recognized as a separate family, um, Hyliidae. But you know, in terms of the criteria that we use, this is very tricky because unlike species, families don't represent actual biological entities and they're human constructs that are meant to help us group and understand the diversity of life on the planet. Um, so given that at its core, family level taxonomy 
can in some cases come down to personal preference and philosophy on what a family represents. Mm -hmm. But generally, I think we really try to preserve the traditionally recognized families um, so that we really can communicate effectively back and forth. Mm -hmm. And changes are only necessary when we find that something just doesn't fit within that traditional group anymore. Um, either they're not related, um, we find that they're not related, or um, and they best belong in another group, or they're not really related to anything, and they really deserve recognition as a separate family unto themselves. Um, so it, it's very messy, but um, I, I do think that we are kind of settling for the most part on a uh, on a family level taxonomy. Um, Shared understanding of that. Yeah. Great. Pam, um, what implications does avian taxonomy have on conservation? Oh, it has tremendous implications um, because every time you split, you're reducing the population of the two component species, right? So uh, a good example that we talked about earlier is the um, Philippine hawk owl, formerly a single species over the entire archipelago except uh, Palawan. And, and uh, we eventually were able to accumulate enough recordings and morphological data to show that there were seven species involved. Mm -hmm. And only one of those is not considered to be in um, immediate danger. So only one of those is, is considered least concern status by um, by BirdLife International and IUCN because that, that one is the one that occurs on Luzon and several other islands. All the others have restricted or even really minuscule ranges. One was even thought to be extinct before being rediscovered on the island of Cebu. So that's just one of many examples that we could use, but one that I happen to have worked on. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And any other thoughts on that? All right. So the other question that I have here is, you know, I understand that a non-scientific audience also can contribute to avian taxonomy, to the advancement of avian taxonomy. And I think that is could be really surprising to a lot of people out there. So can you all explain how citizen scientists, how collecting information in the field and submitting it can have an effect on this? Pam, do you want to start? Oh, uh, so we uh, whenever uh, whoever is working on a taxonomic committee usually tries to use as much information as possible to make decisions. And uh, it used to be that there wasn't anything online that was useful. And now, of course, there's a tremendous amount of online material, much of it here, you know, at Cornell. And um, and so the the contributions of of um, non scientists and other people interested in birds in eBird and uh, just uh, contributing their photographs and their recordings, et cetera, is really uh, extremely useful. It makes a huge difference because we can do much more than visit museums and examine specimen collections that, that uh, it's very time consuming and takes, um, you know, takes a lot of travel, et cetera. Um, and it's uh, specimen collections are not complete by any means uh, representation of, of, you know, the, the variation within bird and uh, and being able to uh, quickly visualize what's happening, for example, at a hybrid or a potential zone of contact uh, is extremely useful. For example, in some cases, we're able to to evaluate uh, whether the characters that are that, are, that have been given uh, as a rationale for splitting something really hold up in the potential hybrid zone. So the more the better, really. The more um, recordings, the more photographs, the more um, checklists that are submitted, as long as every, you know they're accurate, of course, uh, the better. You're right, right. So, so the media, for example, the photos and the sound recordings are tied to location and date, and all of that has an important effect on the, the ability of scientists to evaluate that information when it comes to evaluating splits and lumps. Great. Yeah, and, and and audio recordings, especially, you know, um, you know, Pam mentioned, you know, earlier on how you know we really try and take an take an integrative approach to assessing species, and for some groups, uh, like vocal differences are are absolutely key to understanding species level taxonomy, and 
um, the audio recordings posted to eBird through Macaulay Library have really allowed us to better understand the geographic variation of those of those vocalizations to get a better sense of um, what's actually going on on the ground. I, I would just jump in and add one more one more piece. I'll go video off again. Uh, one more piece in defense of photos of live birds as opposed to dead birds in trays is things like eye color and leg color and soft parts uh, don't preserve well on specimens. And the best you can hope for usually is that the collector said, I was red. And their definition of red may vary from someone else's. But, um, but with the amazing photos that so many uh, people are contributing through eBird and 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 other resources is giving this huge data set to be able to assess things like that in a new way. Great. Yeah, and I really again want to emphasize the importance of um, the audio as well. Um, a lot of the cases that we're grappling now, trying to you know, a lot of the splits that are coming down the pike are because we're dealing with things that had been uh, classified by people decades ago who knew these birds only through specimens you know things that were not singing and, did, and had cotton eyes and as marshall says the color of the bill may have changed from when it was live so the and now as people get out in the field and and encounter these birds in life they're realizing that you know there are these soft part differences previously undocumented. Um, there are all these vocal differences. And, uh, you know, anybody with, you know, who's a, the slightest bit intrepid and carries with them a camera or an audio recorder or both has the potential to bring back reams and reams of information that, that you know, really was inaccessible to everyone until just a couple of years ago. And sharing those resources uh, through an institution like like Macaulay uh, has been tremendously valuable to our work. It, it's one thing to read a report that the song might differ from this island to another. It's another thing to go into Macaulay Library and be able to hear those differences yourself and really understand it. And that's what drives it home. And you know, there are any number of nameless heroes that you know that have supported our work through their contributions to uh, to Macaulay Library. Now, please keep it up. You know, it's it's we we can't overstress the value of this. Mm -hmm. And there's one person who wrote in to ask: Do the recordings done to idea species using Merlin uploads upload to eBird? Do they have to be marked verified? So how I think the question is, how do the, the recordings that a person makes using e, uh, Merlin then get, would, do they get considered in the eBird and the Macaulay Library um, considerations? What's it take to do that? So a, a recording that's captured in Merlin um, isn't necessarily feeding into eBird. Uh, a, a, an observer needs to actually download that and upload it to an eBird checklist. And, and that's actually the process we want because we want the human brain to be interacting and saying, yes, you know, Merlin may have thought this bird was species A. I also assessed it with my human brain, agree that it's in the right time, right place, has the right sound and is that bird. So that's a really important piece to highlight about Merlin. However, in eBird we do, in, um, those recordings are feeding into the larger larger data structure. And we do have uh, data vetting processes to try to ensure that those are accurate um, and and a whole whole team of thousands of reviewers that that are are working hard on that every day. Great. Here's a question. Do you ever unrename taxa asking for a mugal? <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts on that? Unrenamed taxa. So in other words. You're talking about changing the name of something? Like, uh, changing and then unchanging. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure that has happened. Um, in fact, I think there was, um, but I'm not, mm -hmm. um, can't think of a great example off the top of my head. It it, it does happen. Uh, it's usually best done quickly, rather than uh, after the fact. There was um, 
um, an example, maybe whenever <laughs> whenever we split sharp-tailed sparrow, we we lived through an awkward period where we had Nelson's sharp-tailed sparrow and salt marsh sharp-tailed sparrow, and that was a very uh, short-lived experiment. And those names were changed in uh, in short order. Um, I, I I'm not going to make any particular predictions about reverting to mugol that was already discussed by the north american classification committee and and in this particular in this instance it was uh, the re reverting to mugol was was rejected yeah. now we'll see if mugol develops a significant constituency going forward or not I, I wouldn't expect changes in in that particular case yeah pam i will add that mu actually means gull, so mu is not an a good uh, adjective for goal. It actually, <laughs> means goal. interesting. Um, another question is: Will there be a new dendrogram of all the birds of the world? Well, there's actually a project uh, going on here at the lab to develop just such a thing, um, led by Elliot Miller. Um, I think that will happen. I can't, I'm not going to put any kind of a timeline on it, but we, we do have a, a team of people who are very interested in uh, just that question. We, all of us here, think it would be a great adjunct to all the other information that we display through our projects here at the lab. So we're uh, supporting Elliot and wishing him all the best. So uh, cautiously optimistic that this will happen. Um, but like I said, it's it's too early to put any kind of a timeline on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, and if, if updating, I, I was just going to say, if updating eBird records is a huge challenge, imagine updating genetic samples from across uh, researchers across multiple countries and Right, uh, this is a case where the different taxonomies, you know, create massive roadblocks. A lot of Elliot's time is trying to figure out when one researcher uses a particular name, a lot of his time is spent trying to figure out how that relates to the Clements taxonomy. If if we had one taxonomy and everybody was using it, we'd be much farther down the road than we are right now. Uh, he's, he's trying as hard as he can to crack those nuts. Right. Somebody wrote in to ask, since there are four checklists, how should one decide which one to use? Are some of them better at different things? I think very personal decision, I, I imagine, and what tools you want to use um, around the world, right? Whether if somebody wants to use the benefits of eBird, then you're, you know, you're better off sticking with uh, eBird Clements taxonomy, but there might be advantages to using IOC for some other folks. So does anyone want to speak to that? Well, I would hope that in a year or two, the question would become mute and everyone would be using the uh, consensus uh, working group checklist. So, you know, just hang in there a little bit and uh, see where we are when we when we complete that process. Right. Okay, so a lot of specific questions regarding species, which um, due to our time, we cannot go into that direction, but um, yeah. But we may try and follow up individually. Do we have contact information for people? Um, uh, I would suggest that if you have a specific question about a species group, I mean, our team can't specifically answer all of them, um, but we can lead you to some information. We'll do our best to get back to you. So write birds at birdsoftheworld.org, and we will try to field those questions for you. So we'll do our best because I know it's a this is uh, there's so much inform so much interest in the information presented today and having access to the experts is a real privilege. Thank you all for for being here. Um, let me see if there's anything else here that I could ask. Um, so yeah, just the last question somebody had you know asked about bird names and you know obviously they're extremely important they impart a significant amount of information whether it's meaningful historic or symbolic and but bird names as we you know there is a movement that to kind of eliminate harmful bird names and i just wondered um is the working group working on that or is that another group marshall 
Um, yeah, so it, it's obviously a really important question. Um, the 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 WGAC is not explicitly taking on English names because we have these sort of uh, established um, variants around the world, gray plover and and things that that probably will stand. It, the eBird Birds of the World system for for alternate English names allows us to have more than one English name in use in in different regions. So, um, so we take that approach. Uh, there is a, a American Ornithologist uh, Ornithological Society uh, group working on the question of harmful bird names and how best to address those. Uh, and so we totally support that effort. Uh, Pam and I are actually both participating in that in that effort. And um, we're sort of looking forward to to that group taking the lead on on how to how best to tackle those names going forward. Great. So I think we answered this earlier, but maybe it was a recent question. So maybe we should just address it again. Are there plans to include taxonomic synonyms in the Birds of the World website? I think perhaps that can be best done through the common names. Is there a plans to include a taxonomic synonyms in the Birds of the World website? Uh, not that I'm aware of, not, not complete synonymies. Um, you know, I, they, they have their value. Um, a lot of that information can be found already online. You know, the old Peter's checklist is online. Catalog of Birds in the British Museum is online. Catalog of Birds in the Americas is online. Um, synonymies are, uh, you know, are useful at times, um, but to do them in a truly comprehensive way, which is, you know, is would be a massive amount of work. And if you're not going to do it in a comprehensive way, then decisions would have to be made about, you know, just how deep do you go. Uh, I would say that we have our hands full trying to keep the Birds of the World species accounts current, not just with the annual taxonomic changes, but with the huge volume of natural history, basic natural history information that is published each year about birds. And we're trying to stay abreast of all of that. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so I would I would not count on BOW um, providing that information. We in, in terms of I'm, I'm just going to say quickly that in terms of the checklist consolidation project, there is a parallel. You know, Pam and I, Marshall, were focused on uh, species level taxonomy, but there is a whole separate bibliographic team that is compiling original description data on, on every species and subspecies and so forth. It's possible that they will want to go deeper into synonymies. I don't want to speak for them, but it, it would, I could see something happening through that avenue before it happens through, through BOW. If it does happen anywhere, of course, you know, and it's publicly accessible, we, we could try and incorporate it. But trying to do it ourselves from scratch, I'm, I'm not sure. I see. Well, let's hear what Sean has to say. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, you, you can also check out Avabase um, for um, lists of synonymies as well. Um, did, uh, Marshall mentioned Denis Lacage earlier, and um, that that website and that source is um, really useful for diving into some of that, some of those issues as well. Yeah, what, what's displayed in, in Avabase, I'm not sure is you know, is, is truly comprehensive. Uh, there are many more names out there than you could shake, imagine shaking a stick at if you really wanted to get deep into the weeds. So like I said, the key question is just how deeply do you want to, uh, do you want to research that and what, what do you really think you want to display? But um, that's, that's kind of, to me, that's kind of a separate, separate question. So the lab works, well, the working group works on the, the, you know, the new taxonomies, the lab incorporates it into all of our projects, into Birds of the World and Niebert and Merlin and, and Macaulay Library. Um, so what, we, we released that in October, right? So our plan is to release another one next October, is that correct? 
Okay. And what urgent questions, just last question here for you is, is there anything in particular that you're excited about tackling at the at this level in the next year? I'd like to hear from any of you. Uh, well, we still have a lot of uh, families with interesting taxonomic uh, issues that we haven't uh, dealt with. We'll be looking at some sub coming up soon. Uh, Nereidae and Thamnophilidae. We have a tremendous number of uh, other families like uh, Cargillidae that hasn't been uh, dealt with either. Lots of uh, interesting questions there. So, um, so the famous red poles, for example, we haven't we haven't addressed. Pam, you have some thoughts. I was going to mention seabirds and gulls. <laughs> Lot, lot, lots of interesting, uh, lots of interesting groups yet that we haven't even touched, and they'll, I know they'll give us a lot of uh, things to think about. And uh, I'm excited for higher level taxonomy um, coming coming into into discussion as well. So, excellent. And I'll just say I'm excited about the big picture. Every every set of changes that we get closer to consensus on will make birds of the world, eBird, and bird conservation around the world work better so that's a really great point all right well thank you all so much for being here with us today i know we got to close up i apologize to anyone who didn't have the time to watch the whole thing in person but you'll have the recording um we'll put some links in the chat or maybe jessica's already done all that